Um, and the speaker will be uh, Professor uh, uh, Jayakanth Ravachandran, who is uh, visiting campus from the University of Southern California uh, that day, and so we'll be speaking as part of Nanoet Tech. Um, I also wanted to make an announcement about an um, event put on by Jin. Jin is our Graduates in Nanotechnology student group, um, and uh, they are going to be meeting with uh, Professor Tim Leon from Emory, uh, who is an expert in physical chemistry of fuel cells, and it will be a lunch meeting for students. It won't be a seminar, but more kind of a more informal kind of get together, and that will be uh, in Pettit in the Pettit Building on March 28th at 11 a.m. And if you want to attend that, just see Quinn right over here. So it's a, a pleasure to have with us uh, today uh, Professor Bernard Kiplin. Uh, Professor Kiplin um, got his master's in solid state physics and PhD in nonlinear optics at the University of Louis Pasteur in France. Um, he then spent some time at CNRS in France um, and as well as on the faculty at the University of Arizona before coming to Georgia Tech in 2003 um, where he is uh, uh, the Joseph M. Pettit Professor in a School of Electrical and Computer Engineering he, as well as the director of the Center for Organic Photonics and Electronics, otherwise known as COPE, um, and also co-president of the Institute Lafayette, which is a facility um, at the Georgia Tech Lorraine campus. Um, he's won a number of awards, including NSF Career Award. He's a senior member of IEEE and a fellow of the Optical Society of America, among others. And so it's a real pleasure to welcome him today. <coughs> Thank you very much. Well, thank you, David, and good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for showing up. I know it's beautiful out there, and it's very tempting to, to have that slice of pizza in the bright sun rather than having to listen to a seminar, but hopefully uh, won't make you regret your choice. And so, yeah, thanks for being here and for, for showing up. And thanks to uh, also the IEN team who organizes that uh, seminar series. It's always a pleasure to be here and be able to share some of the research that's done by uh, my group, and so I'm always just a reporter, and the full credit for the research that I'll be presenting today goes to my students, as well as uh, I'd like to highlight uh, the contributions from Canek Fuentes Hernandez, who's a principal research scientist, and who has been working with me all these, all these years, and uh, who's contributing significantly to uh, the output and uh, some of the results. And so, you see some of the group members, uh, new students that I haven't had a chance to add yet to the slide, and also would like to acknowledge uh, longtime collaborators on campus and, and others. The slide is not large enough to give credit to all the people. Hopefully, I'll give some credit along the way. And so, what I'd like to do today is first uh, just place a little bit what we do into a broader context, and I think many of you kind of students uh, or uh, scientists and engineers in training kind of trying to figure out what's the best track or the best choice for your future careers. And I know these are difficult times and sometimes there's a lot of anxiety. Should I go and work for industry? Should I go and work in a national lab? Or should I, should I join academia? And uh, I think that we live at really very exciting times, challenging but very exciting times. And uh, part of these challenges have to do with some macro trends. And obviously, you know, the, what's driving these changes is a really strong increase in the world population. This is probably the slide in my presentations that I have to update the most often because uh, the overall population is growing at a pace that's incredible. And the way we live, the way we interact, is also changing drastically. And so we live at a time where Technology is changing at a pace that's just unprecedented in human history, and there are a lot of consequences to that change and that pace. And uh, I guess I'm an optimist, so I always see opportunities in challenges. And so I think that the topic of my talk, which is on organic semiconductors, hopefully I will be able to convince you that these are really interesting materials that can address some of these challenges that are associated with the times uh, we live in. And so to kind of illustrate that world in flux, there are many ways you can do that. But one, th one, one way I thought was quite interesting is if you go back and you look at um, uh, the 
companies, the largest companies based on uh, market, these are private companies based on market capitalization. And you kind of look what happens over the last uh, uh, 30 years. Uh, you can see that, you know, in the 90s, um, you had one, what I call carbon burner, okay, or carbon producer, and then the other companies, particular GE and NTT, were basically really developing technology, hardware, processes, know-how, a lot of patents. Actually, the infrastructure that made today's world possible, especially the internet, and then in the 2000s, you can see that uh, GE is still on the list there, but uh, the other uh, three large companies based on market capitalization are all in the fossil fuel production and, 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 and burning. And now, nowadays, this has completely changed where you recognize the companies which actually have really are responsible for the lifestyle we have, namely, the, you know, running around looking at a little piece of uh, glass and uh, doing all kinds of uh, activities that have to do with uh, the digital world. So is that the future? Is that, uh, you know, should we all switch careers and basically go in computer science and uh, uh, are the brightest career in, uh, in just data? And uh, maybe, but uh, if you look at the current technology trends, and here's just kind of a limited list, I believe that while uh, there are a lot of uh, exciting areas that take advantage of that digital wave, there's also a need for uh, other uh, ex you know, emerging areas, and uh, those will be enabled by smart materials. And I consider organic semiconductors uh, as part of that class of smart materials that are really needed in order to uh, develop uh, new technology. And so I believe that we are at a threshold where, you know, in the past when you look back, there was kind of that uh, third uh, industrial revolution that, asso that is associated with the development of the microprocessor and then the, all the internet and, and the digital age. But now there's a new component where we're going back where we don't just mix or merge the physical and the digital world, but there is also a convergence with the biological world. And part of this has to do with some of the in incredible discoveries that are being made in biology uh, especially in gene editing like CRISPR-Cas9, uh, where we have a hard time measuring the consequences and who knows what will happen in the next or, or 10 years, okay? So I think there is an accelerated convergence and, uh, you know, the, 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 the term fourth industrial revolution was coined by uh, Klaus Schwab, the founder of the World Economic Forum, and there's a book about it. I read it, I found it fascinating. Uh, if you like, like to read, I uh, highly recommend uh, this, this book. And so I, I believe that in the next five to ten years, uh, I'm a, I have an optics background, so I, I like to talk in terms of par particles, but also in terms of waves. And what I like about waves is when you have two waves is to look at constructive interference. And so I think that we're at a time where there's on one hand the digital wave, on the other hand there is what's called that deep tech uh, wave about processes, new materials, uh, new inventions, and I think if we play it well, and you can, if you can have a constructive convergence or interference of these two waves, uh, some great things will come uh, out of it, okay? And so some of these great things I'm convinced with and, and an important class of smart materials are carbon-based semiconductors or organic semiconductors. And so they come generally in two forms, either small molecules, which has a, have a relatively small molecular weight, and so you can process these molecules into thin films, using vacuum deposition techniques. You just heat them up above their sublimation point and they condense on a substrate and you have your thin film and you can build all kinds of optoelectronic devices with these materials because they do have light emitting and as well as electronic properties or optoelectronic properties. And then there's another class of materials which are these uh, large molecules or polymers where you, you stitch little parts together and these macromolecules are so large that you can dissolve them in solvents and so you can formulate inks, and you can use these inks and print them, or coat them, using coating or printing technique. And all of this is done at room temperature, which is quite interesting because that means these materials, you can process them into thin films, and they are compatible with any substrate. You don't need to have to worry about, you know, heating things up at a very high temperature. And that's also important in terms of keeping the overall energy that is used for the manufacturing of these devices very low especially if we look at large scale, okay? 
And so organic semiconductors have been around for a while. Actually, uh, some of these, the studies of these molecules goes back to the development of synthetic dyes because they had very nice colors. And some of these same, what provides color, colorful aspects to these dyes actually have to do with the structure that also are responsible for the electronic properties. And so that started in the end of the, the 19th century and then in the early uh, uh, 20th century, people started to study the optical properties of these dyes in dilute solution. And then in the 80s, 70s, 80s, uh, really the whole field of making and the concept of making solid state devices with these materials started. And today, it has grown into a huge industry and the largest, the most advanced industry is the use of these dyes as light emitters in organic light emitting diodes. So many of you might own a phone or a TV where the display technology is no longer that legacy liquid crystal display technology where you have a backlight and then you control the light emission through these little electro-optic valves with the liquid crystal. But where you have a thin film that's sandwiched between two electrodes, you apply a voltage, you inject current, and you have light emission. And so you can see on that scale here, these are, this is basically in billions of uh, US dollars and uh, it's, it's, it's growing. And I think that the size of these displays will continue to grow as we move from uh, vacuum deposition through shadow mask type uh, deposition techniques towards uh, printing on uh, roll to roll on very large area. And so these molecules actually quite simple. They consist of a few carbon atoms that are connected to one another. Sometimes uh, a few other like oxygen or nitrogen. And then uh, uh, thanks to the chemistry of carbon in particular, you can have these structures where you have alternating single and double bonds in these materials. And so you have corresponding uh, molecular orbitals where the electrons can be highly delocalized over the molecule. And then if you bring two such molecules in proximity and this molecular orb orbital starts to overlap, there is electronic coupling between these molecules. And that's what needed to have a charge transfer from one molecule to another one. And you have a, you have a semiconductor, okay? And so the details, I don't have time to explain, but uh, basically uh, it's pretty much uh, like uh, you construct a crystal or a linear chain of atoms that are connected together, except that here uh, these, carbon at these atoms are just carbon. And so you can look at it as just making very long chains of uh, carbon atoms uh, where you have these alternating single and double bonds. And if you make a very long uh, carbon atom chain with a lot of carbon atoms. You have a lot of orbitals here that are occupied and each orbital is occupied by two electrons with opposite spin because of the Pauli exclusion principle. And then you have corresponding unoccupied uh, orbitals. And in first approximation, one generally only considers some of these pi electrons. And then one considers only the highest occupied molecular orbital and the lowest in energy unoccupied molecular orbital. So this is a, is, a lot, is, is a big simplification, but you basically assume that uh, you can describe your semiconductor uh, like a, a, an inorganic semiconductor where you can associate that homo level or homo band with a valence band in a traditional semiconductor and the LUMO with the conduction band. And so with all the corresponding uh, semiconductor physics and the semiconductor equations. And so that's kind of uh, implied here where again, because of disorder and because you have a large system of molecules, not all the orbitals have exactly the same energy. And so you have these homo manifolds and lumo, uh, homo and lumo manifolds, sorry. But uh, you can look at those just as a valence and conduction band. And then you throw in thermodynamics on top of this. And so you're going to have partially occupied uh, uh, states in the lumo here or density of electrons and the density of holes here. And so the rest are you probably familiar with. Uh, because it's very standard semiconductor physics. Now, the semiconductor itself is only one part of the story. In order to make an optoelectronic device, you need to sandwich that semiconductor between two electrodes. And so that's true in a light emitting diode where you're injecting current, you're injecting holes and electrons, or in a solar cell where you absorb light and then you collect holes and electrons. And so for these electrodes, there are two properties that are really important. One is the work function which is the, the energy it takes to basically remove an electron from that electrode and then the conductivity or the sheet resistance because you, you don't want to have 
uh, high sheet resistance, otherwise you would have some losses. Okay? And so these two properties can be combined. That uh, basically is an introduction and provides the motivation for some of the uh, examples that I will pick next and uh, show you. Uh, I selected a couple of uh, recent studies we've done in three different areas. And the first one is about to cal calcium oxide, which is an insulator. And so if you fabricate devices with such materials that have low work function, you have to encapsulate it or protect it from the environment very well. So you need to have very expensive, very sophisticated, and complex uh, barrier coatings. So but that's only one way of uh, <coughs> getting a low work function electrode. The other way, and uh, I've discussed that many times in the past, I won't today, is to actually, you can pull down uh, the vacuum level <coughs> by creating a surface dipole, so through surface modification. Or the other way where we can, you can change the, the work function is to take one of these semiconductors and electrically dope it. And so if you dope it, if you have P-type doping, uh, and you add holes uh, into that uh, homo band uh, down here, so you bring the Fermi level energy uh, closer to that uh, homo band, you'll end up with a material which has a high work function. On the other hand, if you end dope it and you bring it up here, you get a material that has a low work function. And in addition, because these materials are electrically doped, they're also electrically conductive, and so they serve both purposes. You control the work function, and you also have a conducting material. And so uh, next, I will give you an example of uh, electrical doping here as a way of producing low work function electrodes. And fortunately, uh, these two techniques here lead to low work function materials that are far more stable than if you build devices with electrodes that are made out of calcium or magnesium. Okay? So that's very helpful. So traditionally, if you take silicon, for instance, the way uh, silicon solar cells are manufactured, they rely on a PN junction. So you start with a P-type piece of silicon, and then you fabricate an N-type uh, layer on top in order to make your junction. Now, the way this is done is either through ion implantation, or you can heat up the material to about 1,000 degrees for an hour. And then you have these dopant materials that diffuse into the silicon and do the doping for you. So it's a very energy intensive process. Here, what we've discovered with these organic semiconductors is that you can take a film that you first deposit on your substrate, and then you dip it into an oxidizing solution of polyphosphomolybdic uh, acid, or PMA, and providing that you have the right solvent, because it's a process which we believe is mediated by the solvent and also some, some hydrogen. I don't have time uh, to, uh, to, to, to go into details here. But all it takes is you take that film, you dip it in a liquid for a few seconds at room temperature, you take it out, you clean it, you're done. Okay? And uh, that works actually like a charm. And so just to show you that this is what's happening, these are XPS data, and these are just measurements of the surface of a film of poly-3 hexyltiophene. This is a well-known uh, semiconductor that's widely used in organic solar cells, for instance. And you see on top here is that phosphomolybdic acid the, the diluted in the various solvents. And the solvent is very important here. It works either with nitromethane or acetonitrile. And you see this is actually, it's what's called a Kagan structure. It has uh, 12 molybdenum uh, atoms. Uh, it has a phosphine oxide, the core here, and has uh, oxygens uh, are surrounding this molybdenum. Uh, it's a well-known reagent in, in chemistry, but uh, as you will see, it works really well as an electrical dopant, as a P-type electrical dopant. And so what uh, uh, X-ray photoemission spectroscopy gives you signals of uh, you know, different orbitals of different elements. And so you can see here that in a film that's been dipped into a PMA solution, uh, for just uh, uh, 10 minutes here, and uh, at 0.5 molar, you can see these peaks appearing, which are signatures of the molybdenum, while, uh, of course, in a neat film of poly-3 uh, hexyltiophene, you don't see uh, uh, these, these signatures because there is no molybdenum in there. But the question is, uh, you know, is that just a surface effect or is it a bulk effect? And so what you can do is you can start etching the film, and then after you've removed a thin layer, you repeat the experiment. And so you can follow the composition of these atoms uh, or produce kind of a profile, a concentration profile of these atoms in the film. 
And that's what's shown on this slide here. It's a depth profile of uh, signatures of different atoms as you go from the surface of the film into the film itself. Okay? So it's a diffusion process, but it's a diffusion reaction process, which makes it really interesting because if you had only diffusion and you just apply fixed law and you wait long enough at steady state, basically the dopant is in the film entirely and you don't have a gradient or you don't have a concentration profile. But here, as the dopant penetrates into the organic semiconductor, it electrically dopes it. And so the film becomes charged, it becomes more ionic in nature, and that controls the diffusivity of new dopant molecules. And so there is an action-reaction process until you reach a steady state, and this actually gives you a doping profile uh, which is exponential. And you see that the, the typical uh, profile, profile here, uh, the depth here is an exponential pro profile with a typical decay constant of the order of 10 to 20 nanometers. So not only does the film get efficiently doped, but the dopant happens only over a thickness of 10 to 20 nanometer, which in our devices would be kind of the typical thickness of a layer. So if you wanted to produce a, a separate uh, a whole collection layer in this case, because we want a high work function electrode, you would have to deposit for instance, a layer of molybdenum oxide that has that 10, 20 nanometer thickness. Here, through that simple dipping and diffusion process, you get to the same results. So on the right-hand side, you see some spectroscopic ellipsometry data. Again, just verifying independently that we have these exponential profiles with a certain penetration depth of 10 to 20 nanometers. This is really important because if the dopant goes everywhere, your semiconducting film becomes a conductor and you don't have diodes anymore. So that's really key uh, to be able to apply this to devices. And so here you see the changes in electrical properties. On the left, you see the sheet resistance of some uh, P3HT films. In green here, upper left, you see the, the sheet resistance of a pristine P3HT film. And then you see here the uh, depending on the concentration of the dopant, but uh, in a high concentration and after only uh, about 100 seconds, you can see that you can modify the resistivity or the conductivity here by uh, nearly five orders of magnitude. And on the right hand side, again, is an independent measurement of the work function. And you can see that the work function of a pristine film is about 4.45 electron volt. And after doping, you know, it shifts to about 4.9. Uh, so that you have a almost 0.5 um, EV shift. And remember, uh, every 60 milliEV, you change the density of, uh, of carriers by one order of magnitude. So uh, it's a very efficient uh, doping. Now, the nice part is that so far I showed you that that works if you have a neat film of P3HT. But when we produce solar cells, we blend different materials together and we have an electron donor and an electron acceptor. And so here's an example of such an acceptor with one of these fullerene molecules. And so when you blend the fullerene with that P3HT, that's the layer that absorbs the light. And then you sandwich that layer between two charge collecting electrodes and then two electrodes, one that is transparent here, ITO, that's where the light comes through. Another one which is reflective, which is the top silver electrode. And that's kind of the standard structure of a, of a solar cell. But instead of fabricating that separate film here of molyoxide, which requires vacuum deposition, and also molyoxide is quite air sensitive, so you have to package these devices, which is a challenge, you can also take the blend of these two materials and apply the same doping technique. So you spin coat the blend of these materials, you have your thin film. And then you have to do is just dip it in a solution of PMA for about a few minutes at room temperature, and you get that doping over a typical thickness of 10 to 20 nanometers. Okay? And because this is heavily P-doped, has a high work function, it makes it an efficient hole collecting layer for the solar cell. And so we're able to do that, uh, and here's the current voltage characteristic of these devices in the dark and under illumination. And you see the corresponding power conversion efficiency of these solar cells uh, close to 5%, which with P3HT is really close to the best devices you can fabricate using that specific material because it doesn't absorb the, the spectrum of the sunlight very efficiently. 
I remind you that for those of you who, not, who haven't followed the field of organic photovoltaics very closely, the latest materials which have better electrical and better optical properties, they can convert sunlight into electricity with a power conversion efficiency of 15%. Okay, 15. So it's getting close to silicon. The gap between silicon and organics is, is actually shrinking. Now, can we do better than that? And the answer is yes. So you, I showed you that you can go from a reference device where you have that uh, uh, moly uh, oxide layer, and instead of depositing a layer like this, you can just electrically dope the active layer and have an efficient solar cell. But you still have that separate layer of that amine-containing polymer at the bottom, which serves as an electron-collecting electrode or a layer that modifies ITO in order to turn it into a low work function electrode. And there's another trick you can play, is you can actually mix PIE together with the materials that form the active layer, and then during film formation and drying, because of vertical phase separation, there's a rich phase of PIE at the bottom here that interacts with the ITO, and uh, that gives you the same effect in terms of modification of the work function. And so you can see we went from having a, a device where you have three separate layers and sharp interfaces here to a device where you just have one layer and one single coding, coding step and, and one single dipping step here for the doping and then you just evaporate or print the, the top electrode. Okay? So that's, that's actually uh, uh, quite remarkable because you can end up, with, which is the simplest solar cell architecture you can think about, it's just a single layer not counting the electrodes and no sharp interfaces. And so we've done that with various polymers, not just with P3HG, just to, to illustrate that the technique works with mo some of the more efficient materials and, and some of those don't even require any annealing steps. So, all right, so that was the first example. Let me switch gears now and talk to you about uh, some of the research we're doing in the field of organic light emitting diode. As, uh, as I told you, this is driven by two different uh, areas. One is on uh, perfect materials for next generation displays. You can make very power efficient displays. You could make larger displays. You can think about printing displays. You can make rollable displays on paper, on plastic. It's coming. Uh, we've seen kind of a very simple foldable thing, but uh, this is just the beginning of that flexible rollable uh, revolution. And then. Uh, the other area is in lighting. And if you've seen an OLED lamp, lamp or if you haven't, I encourage you, uh, look for them because they are just a quality of light that's unprecedented. It's soft, it's, it's, it's very pleasant. You don't have the glare of uh, these little LEDs. Uh, it's really the future of lighting. And uh, again, you can make it very thin, you can make it flexible, but more importantly, you can also make these light sources transparent. So think of a window, for instance, which during the daytime, maybe filters some of the sunlight because you have a semi-transparent solar cell. You harvest and you store the energy. And then in the evening, you use the window as a light panel to uh, light your room at uh, whatever. So there are things you can't imagine with traditional materials which you can do with organic semiconductors. So I think that's really remarkable. So how do they work? Uh, without going into the details, Again, it's a little bit like what I described before. You have one or a few organic semiconductor layers sandwiched between two electrodes. You bias it, you have a low work function electrode. You're injecting um, electrons through the low work function electrode. You have a high work function electrode, the anode, you're injecting holes. And then these holes and electrons, they, uh, they meet somewhere in a layer in the middle of the device, preferably if you balance hole and electron injection. And then you form excited state. So what is an excited state? On a molecule is, is a state where the highest occupied molecular orbital is half filled with one electron. And then the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital is half filled with another electron. And so if these two electrons recombine, they emit a photon. Okay? So that part is easy, but the problem is that you have these two electrons and they have a spin. And because of the spin, you form different excited states. You can have singlet or triplet states, and you can only have light emission from these singlet states. And so statistically, you can only get, in a traditional dye, you can only get 25% of uh, light emission from all the excited states that are formed by electroluminescence because of that random spin, okay? And so what can we do about this? Can we actually go around this, and can we get light emission 
from uh, uh, these other states, these so-called triplet states. And so the answer is, you know, chemists are very familiar with this. They basically draw these so-called Jablonski diagrams, which are electronic state diagrams. And so S0, that's when the molecule is in a ground state. So you have two electrons with opposite spin in the homo orbital. And, uh, but then you can form uh, either one singlet state or three degenerated triplet states. Okay? And because of selection rules, usually light emission from a triplet state to a ground state is, is forbidden, and you only have fluorescence from the singlet state. Okay? However, you can play tricks, and uh, you can somehow mix some of the singlet and triplet states so that you can partially lift or change that selection rule, or you can play with the energy difference between the singlet and triplet states in order to actually increase the amount of light emission you can have in these dyes. And so again, this is something that was studied as early as in the 1930s in isolated molecules, but was actually applied to solid state devices only until very recently. And so initially, let's say in the mid 80s when organic electroluminescent was discovered and applied to thin films, most of the dyes were conventional uh, so-called fluorescent dyes where you can only have light emission from these so-called singlet states because light emission from the triplet states is forbidden. Okay? So that limits you to 25% efficiency. And then came along phosphorescent materials, which phosphorescence as a process was known, has been known for a long time. And there you can somehow design the molecules by adding a heavy element such that you can have a spin orbit coupling which somehow mixes these two states, the singlet and the triplet state. And because that triplet state now has a little bit of a singlet component, you can have light emission. It's just much slower because the electronic coupling is weaker. Okay? But you, you can have light emission, and so you can have efficient, what's called intersystem crossing, and so you can harvest 100% of the light here. Another way, and this is the latest, is very exciting because this one works very well for green and red emitters, but there's a problem for blue emitters. And the new one is so-called thermally activated delayed fluorescence. And the concept is that by playing with the molecular structure, you can somehow control the energy difference between the singlet and the triplet. And if you make that energy difference sufficiently small, and remember you're at room temperature, so you have that extra KT thermal energy, you can actually have what's called reverse intersystem crossing where these triplet states are re-excite the singlet states from where you can have light emission. So in that process, you can also have 100% efficiency. So how do you do that? You do that by actually designing molecules where you have electron donating and electron accepting groups and by playing with their different coupling and the, 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 the shape and the overlap of uh, the different the homo and lumo orbitals, you can control that the energy different delta EST, and then the reverse intersystem crossing is simply that Boltzmann factor here over that barrier of the T. So if you make that small enough, you can get very efficient emission from that fluorescent state. And so um, we actually started working on such dyes uh, back in uh, 2008, 2009, through a program that was funded by Solve, where we built molecules with these donor and acceptor groups but to be honest, we didn't think about TADF. The motivation here was to actually maximize or balance hole and electron transport. And you do that by building donor and acceptor groups in your molecules. But as we were doing this, and we were getting very nice results, and then we, we, we read in the literature and we learned about TADF materials, we basically found out that accidentally we were actually developing TADF materials. So we went back and uh, uh, tuned the uh, or adjusted that strategy in order to get the right overlap. And of course, we're not only ones, but you can see that within just uh, a few years, the external quantum efficiency of these dyes, which are shown here, a few data points in blue, are now uh, similar to some of the best phosphorescent materials. So this is very, very fast, uh, very uh, exciting uh, new development. And so let me just show you a few examples of devices that we build in my group in collaboration with Seth Marder and Jean-Luc Breda here for the modeling. And so first example I will show you of devices where is that green emitter that's doped in that uh, matrix. Again, I don't want to go too much into the details about the device architecture, but you have hole injection on one side, electron injection on the other side, and these light emitters uh, in between. 
And uh, you can see from uh, this data here that uh, these devices are extremely efficient. So on the left, you see the current voltage characteristic. These diodes turn on at about 3 volts. And then on the right, on, in black, on the left scale, you see the luminance. And on the right, in blue, you see the external quantum efficiency. Now, because these are thin layers of a material that has a relative, relatively high refractive index, a lot of light here gets lost through uh, total internal reflection. And because it's wave guided in the film itself, and so if you have 100% efficiency, internal efficiency, because of these wave guiding effects without any specific light extraction mechanism, the maximum efficiency you can get is somewhere about 25 to 30%. And so you can see that at the low luminance levels that are the kind of efficiencies that we get. So that means the internal efficiency in these devices is actually fa fairly close to uh, uh, 100%. And uh, you know, even at a, a luminance of about 1,000 candelas per square meter, you still get efficiencies that are larger than 20%. Now, l luminance, um, if you're not familiar, is, is, a, is, is a, a metric that's used to um, characterize how much light is emitted by a source. And so for a laptop or for a TV, it's anywhere between 5 and 800 lumens per, uh, candelas per square meter. Okay. So 1,000 candelas per square meter, you can see these devices you achieve by just applying about 5 volts. 5 volts, you have the brightness of the display. With materials that are all carbon and don't contain any uh, heavy elements, so very low cost. And so the, the, the quest here for these materials, or the hopes, is that they can also make very good blue emitters, because uh, blue emission is one of the weaknesses of phosphorescent materials, besides the fact that they rely on having iridium or platinum, which are all very expensive elements. And uh, so we have a DOE program right now. And so a uh, talented student, Xiaoxing, who's about to graduate, actually showed extremely encouraging results with uh, some of these TADF materials in the blue. And you can see by doping some of these emitters in the right host, she could get efficiencies, again, that are in the range of about 25%. But what's also very uh, interesting here are the results they got, uh, she got, sorry, is shown in red here, where you can get efficiencies close to 15% in just a single layer where you have a layer of the pure material, where there is no need to dope that material in the matrix, making the overall uh, geometry and the manufacturing of these devices very, very simple. Okay. All right, let me switch to a third example, uh, which I think is really important because you know, when you talk about organic semiconductors, and especially now less because they are in commercial products, people have more, uh, I would say, respect for what they, they can do in their lifetimes. But for a long time, the, you know, people were very skeptical and said, well, organic materials are fun, they're interesting, but they're not very stable. Okay? And so that's true for a lot of uh, devices and materials. But I will show you in the next five to 10 minutes that actually that's, that's not necessarily the case and that you can design, you can be smarter and you can design uh, devices where uh, you can actually get very long stability. And so transistors, what are they? They are really the building block of any circuit, and they are these gates uh, you know, where the, you control the current that flows between a source and drain electrode by applying uh, a voltage to a gate electrode uh, through an insulator here, a gate dielectric, and then the semiconductor where the current flows between the source and drain electrode. And the problem with any of these uh, kind of MOSFET uh, type uh, transistors is that they age. So when they operate, after a while, uh, you have some carriers that get trapped either in the semiconductor or at the interface between the semiconductor and the gate di dielectric. And that charge trapping, which can be described by an equation, a stretched exponential equation like this, is something you just have to live with. You can minimize it, but you can't get rid of it. Okay? So you can just pick the right material platform and hope that the threshold voltage shift is small. And of course, you see here are simulated or maybe even measured uh, source and drain, uh, I mean, um, drain current values as a function of the gate voltage. And so if you, the, if you have a, a shift in threshold voltage at a certain gate voltage, the current level can change by a lot. And so that's undesirable. You want to get rid of it. So what can we do about that? So a couple of years ago, in my group, we were working on transistors where instead of having just 
one gate dielectric, we actually replaced it with two gate dielectrics, two very thin layer. One was a perfluorinated polymer, uh, which is nice because you can spin coat this with an orthogonal solvent directly on the organic semiconductor. So you can make a very sharp interface here. Very clean, very few traps, not much trapping. The problem is that Cytop is a material that has a low dielectric constant. So uh, the, gate, the capacitance density of a device like this is very low. And so you have to apply a large voltage to operate the transistor. And so to compensate that, we added a high K thin layer that was deposit, deposited by atomic layer deposition. But then we were um, you know, lucky because we, we, we basically stumbled acro across a discovery, totally unexpected as usual, that there was a synergy between the cytop and the aluminum in terms of uh, lifetime and, and degradation. And just uh, lately we've been able, before I tell you what it is, I just want to also tell you that we've made a small improvement recently because we found aluminum oxide by itself uh, undergoes corrosion in a humid environment. And so that was a weakness. So we replaced that part with a nanolaminate where, where we alternate hafnium oxide and al aluminum oxide, very thin layers, a few cycles. And when you grow these nanolaminates, you have a material that's very uh, much more stable than the aluminum oxide. But what's remarkable about these two layers is the following, is that there are two mechanisms. Both have to do with aging under operation of these transistors. But the effect that these two mechanisms have on the threshold voltage, they're opposite. So if you play it smart, if you can control the kinetics of one of these two processes by playing, for instance, with the thickness of that uh, nanolaminate, you can actually make, you can be in conditions where these two effects are there, but they cancel one another, okay? So again, you can't get rid of the aging, but you can add something that ages, but has an opposite effect, and so, the two uh, cancel and so with time, you can see here based on the simulation that you can have extrapolated lifetime for these devices that is up to 10 years. And if you uh, plot this and you look at and you compare the stability of these organic transistors with uh, uh, these bilayer gate dielectrics and you compare it to amorphous silicon, which is widely used for backplane technology in LCDs, it's almost two orders of magnitude better in terms of the stability with similar mobility values. And then it's even better than the metal oxide uh, 10 film transistor. Just the mobility is not quite as high, maybe another factor of 10, but there is hope that can be done with new materials. And then, uh, well, we're not quite as good as a uh, low temperature polysilicon, but uh, it's, it's really, you know, not bad. And so this is something uh, that appeared in Science Advances uh, earlier, uh, almost a year ago. And uh, was, again, pure serendipity. Initially, uh, we didn't mean it, but uh, by just looking at it and, and understanding what was going on uh, it was a very pleasant surprise. So let me, I think that's it. So uh, uh, I don't want, hopefully I convince you that uh, organic semiconductors uh, have a, a bright future. And what I want to do as take home messages through the examples that I discussed here is to, you know, uh, what, I, what we find out in our labs every day is that a lot of the advances we make and all the discoveries are really science driven. So we are engineers. We make things work. Uh, we want to build something that can be used, but we also want to know what's behind and what makes it work. And so, as my hero Louis Pasteur used to say, you know, uh, luck only um, gifts the, the prepared uh, minds, or when you step in a lab, expect the unexpected and uh, do not disregard uh, outliers right away in your data sets. They are sometimes actually the smoking gun for new discoveries and always challenge the conventional wisdom and push the frontiers. And with this, thank you very much for your attention. We don't, ah, oh. yes. Of course, having fully printed devices is the ultimate dream, okay? 
But uh, one of the, remember the problem is organic semiconductors, although you can make them fairly stable, you need to protect them from the environment. So you need barrier coatings. And so what I didn't discuss here is that in addition to that second aging mechanism in that nanolaminate, nanolaminates, and this is work we've, we, we did in collaboration with Sam Graham many years ago, where these nanolaminates were developed as barrier coatings to prevent oxygen and moisture in getting into the device and going into the organic semiconductor. And so, you know, you could envision having kind of a fully printed transistor, but then you would still have to attach or have kind of a barrier coating. And these barrier coatings involve the deposition of some kind of oxides, because as far as I know, there are no all printed, all organic barrier coating technologies known to date that would, uh, you know, protect the, the semiconductor. And so, it's, it's, you, you kill two birds with the same stone here. You have the, the gate dielectric, but at the same time, it's also a barrier coating for the semiconductor. That's a very good question. Yes? Yeah, so it's here. You can buy panels, you can buy megawatts of, uh, of power. Uh, there is a company in Germany that's called Heliatech that is selling panels uh, that are fabricated by vacuum deposition. And then there are some companies in Japan that are also, I think, have panels that are um, for building integrated uh, applications that are based on polymers. Now, I mentioned 15% power conversion efficiency. These are record high efficiencies in small cells. Right now, uh, panels need to catch up the power conversion efficiency. Uh, for some of the polymeric ones, I know is probably closer to 4 to 5%. The Heliatech commercial solar cells, I'm not sure what the efficiency is. It's probably getting close to 10%, I think. So yeah, it's there. Uh, it's 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 no longer uh, <coughs> a laboratory uh, curiosity. It's 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 being deployed. But I think what's really important here. I didn't want to oversell it because there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. But and silicon is great. You know, silicon has so many um, naysayers because uh, it's it's an, the inconvenient truth. Silicon is economic. Uh, it's ready to be deployed massively. It's much better than any. Uh, carbon combustion or fossil fuel uh, gas or whatever uh, CO2 producing technology. But the problem I see or a limitation I see with silicon is it's still a fairly energy intensive process to produce a silicon solar cell. And so the one way to measure this is through the energy payback time, which is how long does the solar cell have to be deployed and harvest energy to produce an amount of energy which is equal to the amount of energy that was used to grow the silicon, fabricate the solar cell, and deploy the solar cell in its first place. And that, of course, depends on the location. The more sun you have, the shorter that period. But in a place like Georgia, it would probably take you know, one year or 18 months for that energy payback time. And this is why, in the long term, I see these organic technologies as the way to go, because you know, we've shown you can do the doping at room temperature 10 seconds as opposed to 1,000 degree for an hour. So the, the, the amount of energy and also the investment in the infrastructure. You know, if you want to build and start making even kind of low tech, uh, you don't necessarily need the highest efficiencies to have a, a, a power source. All it takes if you have enough to recharge a cell phone. In a lot of places in the world, that's like a huge step in terms of the quality of life, if you just have a cell phone and enough energy to actually uh, charge a cell phone or to light, uh, have all kinds of uh, light source after the sun goes down. Uh, it's just amazing how um, the quality of life changes with a little bit of energy. And so I think that uh, I'm a true believer that uh, organics uh, will be uh, the solution. One challenge is that, you know, plastic solar cells, plastic is not good. We have to be very careful how we actually deploy this and make sure that some of these plastic solar cells don't end up in the ocean or in the landfill and so on. But that's why we're also working on building solar cells on paper, on substrates that are biodegradable, 
uh, that can be, you know, that come from natural feedstock. And so there are there are solutions. You don't need to to produce your solar cell on a plastic field. You can you can make it on paper. Yes, yes, we do. And so, and 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 type doping is a little bit more challenging uh, because. Um, um, the, the doping materials themselves are less stable, but there are ways to uh, overcome that difficulty. And uh, one of them is to basically start with materials which, uh, before they electrically, th th that form dimers. Okay, and so the dimer doesn't have the electronic properties that are required to make it an efficient dopant, but the dimer is stable, so you can manipulate it. You can blend it, you can process it, you can put it in your device. And then you activate your dopant such that you break the dimer into two molecules. And these molecules have different electronic properties that now meet the requirements to efficiently dope the material. And so now you can dope you know, in situ, while what you manipulated before was stable. So these are the kind of strategies that my colleague Seth Marder uh, has been uh, uh, using and, and, and inventing and, and, and you know, developing. And there's still work that needs to be done to kind of refine the technique, but that's, that's kind of the approach. Let's manipulate something which is a, a larger or high hierarchy structure that's stable, and then let's do something by either light activated or thermal activation to break it into smaller constituents that then are very reactive, but they react so fast in situ that some of these other degradation mechanisms don't take place because you make it, you make the doping the fastest process. Yeah, yeah. So you have some other technologies that relate to organic semiconductors, which I didn't have time to talk to. But one of them is called electrochromism. And so, you know, my colleague John Reynolds here is one of the world's experts in uh, electrochromic windows. And we've actually worked with him where we, we combined solar cells and electrochromic windows to make a smart window where the, the electrochromic window is actually triggered by the sunlight. So the sunlight and the energy that's produced by the solar cell basically controls the electrochromic window and turns it black. And then when the sun, uh, you know, you can reverse it and, and, and uh, turn it back transparent. So it's not totally black, but at least it's, it's sufficiently um, less transmissive that you, it blocks some of the sunlight. Yeah. So electrochromism. It's the same technology that you have in the rear mirrors in cars. And now they're trying to also make, you know, sunroofs with, uh, or even on some airplanes, some of the windows are electrochromic. It's the same technology. So there you just inject charges and while the material is in a certain oxidation state is optically transparent, if you change the oxidation state it becomes optically absorbing and so it changes color. And you can black and white or you can, you can have different colors depending on the, the absorption spectrum of that corresponding uh, uh, ion. Well, thank you. <laughs> thanks for coming. Oh, thank you. Good talk. <laughs> thank you very much. All right. Oh, thanks. I'll catch you soon. Yeah, okay.